Hi, my name is Dr. Ross Hauser. Welcome to the Hauser Next Center here in Fort Myers, Florida. We're going to talk about a really important topic today, which is basically balance. The scientific term is often said to be the vestibular system, which has to do with balance, especially as it relates to movement of the head. And we're going to talk specifically about vestibular dysfunction and semicircular canal dehiscence, which is kind of a fancy term, but I hope to explain it in an easy to understand way. Maybe for those watching, as it relates to balance, many people will come to Caring Medical Florida, the Hauser Neck Center, and they'll say that they have lightheadedness, they have dizziness, they may have vertigo, uh, they may have autophony, and I, I've had that before, and I'll explain that later, but it's basically you're, you're basically hearing an echo or your voice is just so loud. So, and, and we often call that sound sensitivity. But they'll say that it's worse when they're in a car. So if you're somebody who driving in a car just makes all your symptoms worse, you probably have vestibular dysfunction. Because you don't realize when you're in a car, there's movement, your eyes they're moving so basically the vestibular system of the body that coordinates what your eyes seeing what your head's feeling and uh, basically trying to give you gaze stability and balance in the whole body and there's a very intricate coordination between what the eye sees your inner ear your neck, your eyes, your hearing, like there's, you don't realize all the things that happen when you're in a car or you're driving or even moving. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that. Now this is basically what it looks like. Here's your ear, then sound comes in, and then basically that sound is supposed to go to the cochlea, which that's, that's uh, the organ of hearing, and then certain things happen in the cochlea and those uh, impulses then get transmitted to the brain and then you hear. Now this part of this nerve, so it's cranial nerve 8, is called the vestibulocochlear nerve. So cranial nerve 8 has to do with balance and sound. Balance and sound. So right away we know that sound is somehow associated with balance. And you might say, well, why did God make it that way? Think about you're in your car and all of a sudden somebody honks their horn. They honk their horn and you're like, oh my gosh, like very quickly you have to move, right? You heard a sound, then very quickly you have to move, but you don't get dizzy because imagine if you moved your head really quickly and then you got dizzy, you know, you, you could cause a car, you could cause a major accident. So you could see where there has to be some coordination between your between sound and um, and balance. So this is with uh, the ear, the inner ear, the vestibular cochlear nerve, and then see here it says inner ear is the cochlea, the vestibular nerve, auditory nerve, hearing and the semicircular canal. So that's semicircular canal dehiscence is where part of the bone here is worn out. But you can see here that sound comes in, sound stimulates the eardrum, the eardrum stimulates the three bones, the malleus inca stapes, and then sound is basically supposed to go to the auditory nerve and then go to the brain. But in semicircular canal dehiscence, there's an open window here, a third window that we'll talk about, and sound comes in and then it stimulates your vestibular nerve and then all kinds of crazy things happen. And you know I've done a lot of videos on strain sensation. So imagine if somebody had a sound come in and then all of a sudden they got dizzy, dizzy just from the sound. That's because of vestibular dysfunction and it could be because of semicircular canal dehiscence. So 
basically when when you move when your head moves fluid goes different directions in the vestibular nerve in the semicircular canal so this gives you balance static balance or static equilibrium and then when you move certain things happen in these semicircular canals that have to do with the otoliths which stimulate the hair cells and basically gives you balance so these otoliths are basically like bobbers when you're fishing so recently i was in key west and we were uh i was fishing so i'm fishing I'm not, I'm not a great fisherman, but I, my friend Bill Sawyer and my wife loves fishing. So because my wife loves fishing, of course I go fishing. But that's a whole nother topic. But uh, so <laughs> basically it was unbelievable in the Keys, you, you cast and where my friend Bill had, had the boat, it was almost like every cast you would catch something, you know, snapper and different things. And basically what happened was my, uh, the end of my pole broke and he didn't have like another pole. So then I was, uh, I was fishing with like half of a pole. What was interesting was with the half of the pole, you couldn't, you didn't feel the sensitivity with the bobber. So because I couldn't feel when a fish would bite, I was much less successful at catching fish. You don't realize like the bobber with the way fishing poles are, you can feel that they're biting. Well, basically when you move, these otoliths are like the bobber and then depending on how they're stimulated, it stimulates the hair cells which tell your brain, hey, the head's moving in this direction. And because the head's moving in this direction, the eyes have to move in a certain direction, the neck has to go a certain way, your posture, even your spine has to go a certain way for you not to lose balance. So you can imagine if this system is off, just any little crazy motion of your of your head can cause all kinds of terrible things to happen in the body and even give the person nystagmus, which is the eyes going boom, 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 boom to the side involuntarily, or a person gets vertigo or they just feel terrible, like they're going to pass out. So all these things can occur when there's a problem in the vestibular system. So this just kind of explains that the person's static. So there's a like when I'm just sitting here just like this, the uh, semicircular canal is telling the body, hey, right now there's no movement. Then when I go like this, the fluid flow in here stimulates the otoliths, stimulate the hair cells, tells my brain, hey, we just moved the head down and to the left. And then uh, basically my eyes are going to have a certain reflex and my neck is going to have a certain sensation and I don't get dizzy. But when you, when you accelerate, when you accelerate with your head, basically the otoliths move, the hair cells in the semicircular canal are stimulated and that gives certain information, basically goes to the brain. And like I said, sound, see how here sound goes here to the tympanic membrane stimulates the small uh, bones, malleus inca stapes in jeopardy. Those are the smallest bones in the body. So that's often a question. And sound is supposed to just stimulate here. It's not supposed to stimulate the vestibular nerve. But when you have semicircular canal dehiscence, sound can stimulate that. And you could hear a sound and all these crazy imbalance things happen in the body or with your eyes. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay, so semicircular canal dehiscence is a bony defect in the semicircular canals that cause disequilibrium, dizziness, and sound and pressure induced vertigo. So basically, there's a certain sound or a loud sound and then the person gets vertigo or a person has a pressure difference. For instance, they go scuba diving and or they go up into the mountains and all of a sudden they get vertigo. So that can be from semicircular canal dehiscence. Are thought to occur by a third window phenomenon, which I'll discuss. Acoustic stimu stimuli basically goes to the vestibular system that leads to vertigo and dizziness. Personally, I think the cause of it relates to the jugular veins. 
basically is it may be just a jugular vein problem or it could be an intracranial hypertension problem. There's lots of theories. Maybe the person was born with thin bones, uh, thin bones in their temporal bone. So the semicircular canal or the vestibulocochleal nerve is within the temporal bone uh, of, of the skull. So if somebody was born with weak bones, thin temporal bones, that might cause it. There's acquired, it can be acquired from head trauma, malformations, osteomyelitis, tumors, intracranial hypertension. And then normal treatment is done by an ear, nose, and throat doctor where there's various surgical procedures. I'm not going to talk about the surgical procedures because I think people should exhaust conservative care before surgical treatment. So obviously that's why I'm making this video. Now, basically, semicircular canal dehiscence where there's a defect in the bone of the semicircular canal is found between 3 to 9% of coronal CT scans in asymptomatic people, right? So think about that. Whenever, whenever there's a bunch of people who have an abnormality and it's ace you know, it's asymptomatic. So there's people with semicircular canal dehiscence and it's asymptomatic. It makes me think of maybe people who are diagnosed with that may have another disorder. So then you're like, well, what disorder? Well, you know, many of the videos I make is that it's unbelievable all the things that cervical instability causes. So if you're watching this video and you're like, yeah, I got dizziness, I've been diagnosed with vestibular dysfunction, but I have clicking, popping, grinding in my neck. The symptoms started after I got a chiropractic manipulation or I self-manipulated, or I was involved in a car accident or I fell down the stairs or something. Well, maybe your symptomatology is actually due to cervical instability. So, uh, so cervical instability can give you what? Vertigo and a lot of other symptoms such as dizziness, ringing in the ears, swallowing difficulties, constipation, bloating, migraine headaches, neck pain, you know, all those things. Now, in cadaver studies, the incidence of semicircular canal dehiscence is much lower. It basically occurs equally in men and women. It's bilateral in up to 50% of the cases. Many cases do not cause symptoms, causes auditory and or vestibular symptoms. So let's just talk about some of the symptoms that can be from semicircular canal dehiscence, potential symptoms. Now autophony, where you hear your own voice echoing uh, you know, when, when you talk, I've definitely had that. Ever since my youth, this ear has always been fine after swimming. This ear, man, when I was little, it would be clogged up for like a whole day. And it wasn't until I started getting involved in a lot of neck cases that I realized this ear doesn't drain so good. So when there's extra fluid in the ear, the basically your the fluid is supposed to drain down the eustachian tube into your throat. Well, it turns out my external auditory canal here is the normal angle. This one is more straight, so it just doesn't uh, drain well. So I have eustachian tube dysfunction on this side. So what I have to do now sometimes after a shower is I have to take a Q-tip, stick it in there, uh, even as I do this, I can, I can sense from the shower this morning, I have fluid, a little bit of fluid in my ear here. So I have to do that with a Q-tip, then my eustachian tube drains, then right away I can hear so much better. And if I have autophony where my voice is echoing, it goes away. So autophony can be other things besides semicircular canal dehiscence. Now, with that condition, you can hear your eyes moving or blinking. So if you're somebody who, you know, like right now I can't hear my eyes blinking, if you have that symptom where you can, your eyelashes uh, going together and you can hear it, it could be from this condition. If you hear sounds of your neck vertebrae cracking, so you know, like if you go like this and you hear, so it's, it's as if you have hypersensitive hearing of 
with various sounds. Like you're not normally supposed to <laughs> hear your vertebrae cracking and you're not supposed to hear your uh, eyes blinking. So if you, if, you, if you have that, there probably is semicircular canal dehiscence. Now, other symptoms can be pulsatile tinnitus, and I've done videos on pulsatile tinnitus. Vestibular symptoms, dizziness on straining with loud voices or with Valsalva. So if you're somebody who, when you have a bowel movement, so you strain a little bit and you get dizzy or vertigo, that can be from this. I've had patients who they're carrying things. They're like, doc, I'm just telling you, every time I carry something, it could be very little, like 10 pounds, I get dizzy or I get vertigo. So that can be from a semicircular canal dehiscence. Even weirder symptoms, vibration of the ankle is heard in the ear. So like you could tap on your ankle and you hear it in your ear, or you vibrate your ankle and you hear it in your ear. Straining causes eyes to move involuntarily. So again, that's what I'm saying. Somebody carries something that's you know 10 pounds, 15 pounds, and they're like, all of a sudden, they have involuntary eye movements. So if you have a condition where all of a sudden your eyes move to the left, move to the right, or start going like that, nystagmus, then it's likely that you have a, something going on with your vestibular cochlear nerve. And sometimes you'll get x-rays, MRIs, CT scan, and if it's all normal, because this condition is diagnosed by CT scan. So if you've had that, you have these symptoms and all your scans are negative, you can have a problem in the semicircular canals, your vestibular nerve that's just from cervical instability and intracranial hypertension. So since I'm talking about it now, let me just explain it. So, okay, so if the bone has a defect in it, obviously that can cause a problem in what the semicircular canals are supposed to do, which is, you know, give the proper input to the brain when you move your head. So likely, what if the brain pressure is high and some of that pressure now goes against the fluid in the semicircular canal. So the fluid flow, when you do certain things, it can't move like it, like it should. So then those bobbers, those otoliths, aren't moving the way they should. You could see where that could cause dysfunction. So some of you have semicircular canal dysfunction, not dehiscence, you have dysfunction. So if you have been evaluated by an ear, nose, and throat for this condition, and they said, no, you don't have that condition, or you, the CT scan showed this condition, you had surgery, and the surgery wasn't successful. You know, in other words, you did have this condition, they plugged up the hole, but you still have the symptoms, or maybe even the symptoms are worse. It could be that you have semicircular canal dysfunction and it's a problem with fluid flow within the brain which you know I've done a lot of videos which often that's because of jugular vein compression which we'll talk about which relates to a reversal of the neck curve the neck curve is supposed to be like this so if the neck curve reverses it can obstruct the jugular vein so the brain can't drain so fluid flow in the cranial nerves including including cranial nerve 8 it, it just isn't correct or it gets blocked or inhibited, and of course that can affect vestibular function. Changes in ear pressure cause eyes to move involuntarily. Again, you know, if you go scuba diving, you go in the water, you go up in an airplane, many different things happen to the pressure differences between the inner ear and the, the atmosphere, and certain things are supposed to happen within the vestibular system and if they don't you can get uh, vertigo dizziness this is interesting too tulio's phenomenon which is sound causes the eye to move so if you have tulio's phenomenon where you hear a certain sound 
and then your eyes move involuntarily, you at least have semicircular canal dysfunction and you may have dehiscence. And this is basically what it looks like. So there's defects in the on CT scan of the semicircular canal. Uh, and you know, these are just some drawings that show it, you know, where there's a defect in the bone. Here the fluid's supposed to fluid flow here. So the third window means that now there's a window that isn't supposed to be there. The fluid flow here isn't going to be normal because now there's a place where the fluid can go. You know, and this just kind of explains it. Basically, when you have sound, the sound's supposed to go to the cochlea, but when you have this window, sound comes here and then it goes this direction instead of to the auditory nerve. And it, so basically sound starts stimulating the vestibular system. And the vestibular system, like for instance, if, if my head turns like this, my eyes would obviously want to go this way. So you wouldn't want that to happen automatically, for instance, with a sound, right? So when you and I hear a sound, I mean, nothing happens to our balance normally. So if all of a sudden you hear a sound and your eyes go a certain way or you get really imbalanced because of sound, then it's likely that you have semicircular canal dehiscence or dysfunction. And there's various tests that ear, nose, and throat doctors do that can show that there's a problem with the way sound is transmitted into a certain person. This is very complicated, uh, basically, diagram which shows that certain tests can show that you hear a certain sound and then you get a pulsating of your eyes. For anybody at home who wonders about this, what I would suggest you do is just look in a mirror and subject yourself to different sounds. If you, if you notice there's a little jiggling of your eye, then basically you have semicircular canal dehiscence or dysfunction. These are some of the reflexes that occur when you move your head. So the vestibular ocular reflex is the eye gaze is stabilized during head motion. When you move, there's a reflex that keeps your gaze stabilized. Cervical ocular reflex is when your eyes move in relationship to neck rotation. Vestibulocolic reflex is that stabilizes the head in space when the body moves, and the cervical colic reflex is where the neck muscles tighten to stabilize the head, like when there's a rapid uh, neck motion. Now, the vestibular ocular reflex when that's dysfunctional, and that's dysfunctional in over 50% of patients with mild traumatic brain injury. So whenever you hear concussion, what it means is that there's been a mild traumatic brain injury. And I would encourage everybody here to watch the video that I made on concussion. Uh, on concussion. So you know, and concussion just means is that, that there was a rapid uh, head motion and neck motion and the brain you know hit a little bit here and if there's a whiplash it, the brain might have hit the uh, cranium the cranial vault the bone here so there's a very very minor traumatic brain injury and as we know most of the time the people recover fine but in my opinion sometimes when there's a concussion so imagine uh, I hit my head uh, on a cabinet door that was open that I didn't know it was open. Almost all the time when you hit your head by accident, you jerk your head really quick. Or when a football player, if you notice whenever there's a smash, there's, o there's almost always a quick rotation of the head. And I believe it's that quick rotation of the head injures the ligaments, especially in the upper cervical region. And the residual symptoms of post-concussion syndrome in my opinion, are unresolved upper cervical instability. And that's the main point of the concussion video that I made. The vestibular ocular reflex is commonly abnormal after whiplash injury as our other ocular reflexes. Now, the vestibular ocular reflex allows us to maintain gaze stability when our head is in motion. My main point of this is that vestibular dysfunction 
or severe dizziness with riding in a car or moving a person's head, the reason for it, one of the reasons for it is these reflexes aren't working, but the etiology of it can be multifactorial. Like we said, one of the etiologies is semicircular canal dehiscence. One of them is semicircular canal dysfunction. Other issues can be what? Cervical ligament facet joint injury. And the way we document that is by digital motion x-ray. Because a lot of people will say, Doc, you say that I might have cervical instability, but I had MRIs, I had CT scan, I had x-rays. But I would just say, did you have those things when you were upright and did they move you, right? Because let's be honest, most of us usually don't have dizziness, what? When we're laying down, right? That's usually the position that makes it better. And then dizziness, vertigo often starts when somebody notices, geez, I move my head a certain way and I get dizzy or I get vertigo. So that would mean that the most sensitive test for instability or the positions that are likely to induce dizziness or vertigo are gonna be upright and it's gonna be with motion. So that's how we scan people in the office here. And then we do a thing, a testing procedure called neck vitals where the people are upright and we look at normal pupil dilation, uh, eye pressure, How's the blood flow into the brain, out of the brain? Are the jugular veins open in different positions, even laying down? We do an upright cone beam CT scan, as well as a digital motion x-ray. And the extent of that not only will show us the structural neck issues, right? The neck curve is supposed to be like this, or is it like that? And then is there instability? Is there extra motion of a certain bone certain cervical vertebrae and is that causing these abnormalities and if they are then stabilizing the neck with prolotherapy and doing exercises for encouraging the proper lordotic cervical curve often can resolve the dizziness the vertigo and the other symptomatology now if one looks at if I get jugular vein compression, can I get similar symptoms to semicircular canal dehiscence? And you'll see that many of the symptoms are overlap. Jugular vein compression can also cause fluid to accumulate around the eye nerve, and that gives darkening of vision, visual snow, distorted vision, after images. Same thing as semicircular canal dehiscence, they can get a seasickness feeling. And of course, you can get vertigo, tinnitus ringing in the ears. Now, if somebody researches what actually causes semicircular canal dehiscence, and could it be related to the jugular vein? Well, it turns out the jugular bulb, which is the portion of the, ju of the jugular vein that's basically in the cranial vault, that's actually uh, inside the brain, if you will, it's called the jugular bulb. Well, it runs right by the semicircular canals. So various researchers, and I put a bunch of references here, they've shown that jugular bulb abnormality. So you might say, well, what does that mean? Arterial flow goes into the brain and that red arterial blood gets filtered by the blood-brain barrier. So in other words, toxic things are kept out of the brain. That fluid then becomes clear. That cerebral spinal fluid. So the cerebral spinal fluid, which is clear, it nourishes the brain. Then the brain cells, like any other cells of the body, poop. So all that poop and that waste products are collected by the venolymphatic system in uh, the parts of the brain that are called the venous sinuses. The venous sinuses basically drain into the jugular bulb. Then the jugular bulb goes into the internal jugular vein, down into the heart, and gets processed. 
So w imagine what would happen if there was a blockage of the internal jugular vein at the atlas. Like what would happen to the jugular bulb just above it? So the fluid is trying to get down in, into the body from the brain, but there's a blockage at C1. So wouldn't the jugular bulb dilate? Wouldn't there be increased pressure in the jugular bulb and could wherever the jugular bulb is then start eating away, if you will, the bone that's by it? So basically, they researchers have found that jugular bulb abnormalities can cause semicircular canal dehiscence. There's a higher frequency of jugular bulb abnormalities in patients with Meniere's disease than in patients without inner ear symptoms. There's a high percentage of people with jugular bulb abnormalities that have sensory neural hearing loss, tinnitus, vertigo, dizziness. Jugular vein abnormalities can potentially affect the three communication routes between the intracranial space and the inner ear, the vestibular aqueduct, the cochlear aqueduct, and the internal auditory canal. In summary, what this is saying is if you have a blockage of the internal jugular vein, it can interfere with fluid flow that affects the hearing nerve and, and the vestibular nerve or the balanced nerve. In summary, the cochleovestibular nerve. And this is basically when we do ultrasounds of the jugular vein, that's the jugular vein completely open. Well, imagine if somebody was laying down when the jugular vein is supposed to be open and, look, and it looked like this instead of like that. Or if somebody was upright, like we'll have patients when they're upright in their normal position and the jugular vein is completely closed. So if it's completely closed, what's going to happen to the vestibular cochlear fluid flow? Could it be inhibited? Could the pressure inside of those nerves go up? Could, the, could there be semicircular canal dehiscence? And I would say yes. So this basically shows that upper cervical issues can block cerebral spinal fluid flow, uh, jugular, jugular vein flow. See the jugular vein here. This is what this is on CT scan. This is a CT venogram. And see how the jugular vein is opened here, but right here it's blocked. So basically, this is the jugular bulb right here. So even in this case, see how it's it's big here, it's big here, and it's obstructed here. So if it's obstructed here and the pressure goes increased here and the jugular bulb keeps dilating, dilating, you could see where it could wear out the temporal bone and cause semicircular canal dehiscence. So how do you treat this? Like I said, I'm not going to go into the surgical treatments of semicircular canal dehiscence. I would just defer that to the ENT uh, videos that various doctors make on semicircular canal dehiscence. How we treat semicircular canal dehiscence or people that have been diagnosed with that, I would still have them go through our testing procedure here to look for, is there cervical destructure? Is there a breakdown of the cervical curve? So there's basically three pillars of structural health. One relates to proper alignment, proper cervical curve or body curves, and then is there joint instability? Is there integrity in the ligaments? Are the ligaments strong that they can withstand the forces that the person puts on them so there's not excessive motion of the bones? And again, like I said earlier in this video, that the way we do that is a cone beam CT scan upright, which will show what is the normal 3D anatomy of that person's neck. Then we do digital motion x-ray to show is there excessive motion of the bones. And then if there is, the treatment that we do to tighten the ligaments is called prolotherapy. Prolotherapy is an injection technique that thickens, tightens ligaments to resolve destructive joint instability. And in this case, upper and lower cervical instability. 
I'm here with one of my wonderful patients, Snow. That's an unusual name. Like, why did your parents name you Snow? I was actually named after Snow White. Oh, awesome. You know, and yeah. she's quite beautiful as you are. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> the, I don't have all those dwarves, though. <laughs> the, you know, partly why I wanted to talk to you was there are people that have this condition called semicircular dehiscence. And then you've had three prolotherapies here, and then the semicircular dehiscence, you've had surgery for it. So why don't you just tell us, like, how did you get diagnosed with that? What symptoms that you might have had with that? And then surgery helped, it didn't help? Okay. Well, I first got it, I was a forester in my youth. And we were out in the woods and I sneezed and I held my breath. You know how sometimes you, you know you don't want to spray the person next to you? Held my breath and I heard this little pop. Okay. And it was, uh, it had popped the bone inside up under my brain. There's like a shelf your brain sits on. And I didn't know what that was. I just thought, oh, that's weird. And, uh, but then my hearing changed. So I started hearing things inside my head, like you could swish your eyeballs left and right, and you could hear them swish, swish, swish. Right. And I could hear my heartbeat in my ear. So I got used to being able to tell what my pulse was because I could always hear it. Wow. Um, it made very loud sound. I started walking very softly because when you would walk, it would reverberate up through your body. Or if you like, move your arm and your wrist kind of pops, you could hear it reverberate all through the body. And when I would talk inside my head, my voice was buzzy sounding. So like if I would sing, it would sound like bzz, 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 you know? So it wasn't really fun to sing anymore. Yeah. And then the other thing that would happen was I would kept losing my balance and falling off to the right. Mm -hmm. So even as a young person, I, I just went and bought a cane because I kept falling towards the right-hand side. Yeah. Uh, didn't really know what it was, but eventually it got worse and worse. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did some internet research and f I saw a TV show Good. about somebody. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, that's what I have. So uh, then I found out in order to fix it, you have to cut a hole in your skull. So we put that off a couple years. Well, eventually it got, it progressed and like the hole got bigger and more holes. And it got to where when my heartbeat would go, my eyes would twist to the right, to the heartbeat. Or if I was in a restaurant and there was music, my eyes would twist to the beat of the music. And that made it very hard to read, yep. very hard to drive, very hard to be around a mm -hmm. lot of people, and also caused conductive hearing loss, which I didn't realize how bad it was until after I'd had the surgery, and then I was like hearing sounds like, what is that sound of water? Oh, well, there are pipes in the walls. You're hearing the water go through the walls. And I'm like, I hadn't heard that in years. I forgot it was a thing. So. Uh, after the surgery. And that was in 2012. 2012, yeah. I had the surgery in Atlanta and um, it was successful and I corrected, it corrected a lot of those things. I could hear better. Uh, I, my heart, eyes stopped twisting to the uh, beat of my heartbeat. I missed hearing my heartbeat. I was kind of used to the constant companion. Uh, but um, I had a little problem during surgery in that they had my head twisted this way. And we didn't know at the time I had Ehlers-Danlos. And so my C2 got malrotated, and then that ended up compressing my internal jugulars, which we didn't know what it was back then, we know what it is now. And so my brain pressure got higher and higher, and I was having these terrible headaches. Well, when we went to the doctor um, to get the staples out, because I had the staples, like a little rainbow of staples here, I looked great with half my head shaved. <laughs> and um, I was in really bad shape. And, you know, having 
had chronic illness all my life. I was used to ignoring pain. Well, I didn't know that was a really bad thing. So he uh, saw that I was in really bad shape in the office. And so they just said, I'm not even calling an ambulance. We're one block away. Let's load you in the car. And they took me in and they did surgery uh, right away uh, and drilled a hole in the top of my head. So now I have a hole here to fix the hole inside and then a hole on top to fix the pressure from the other hole. So I'm holy. <laughs> You're holy. I'm holy. But uh, the brain injury from that took a long time to heal. My visual processing is messed up. I see multiple images. My eyes don't converge. The floor is like up at an angle. The walls are warped. If I look at a swimming pool, it looks like the water is piled up in the middle. So it was a lot of work trying to overcome where things are in space. And I can fake it pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you come to my house, all the pictures are just a little crooked, you know, but my friends come and they'll tip my pictures up to make sure everything's right. And what, what made you decide to come here? Like what made you decide to come to Caring Medical? Like what symptoms did you think, did okay. you want us to help? So um, I have had uh, more and more issues over the years with the head pressure okay. coming back yeah, yeah. and severe vertigo mm -hmm. and uh, brain fog and you know I'm a I'm a biology teacher and I was not able to think straight you know and I teach anatomy to homeschoolers and I would like study all day the day before you know, before a lecture, because my brain would just go. Yeah. You know, and I just, it took a lot of effort just to try and maintain a minimal level of functionality because mm -hmm. of the brain fog. But uh, the headache, the, the headaches, the dizziness, the uh, not being able to think clearly, and my speech would slow. When, when the pressure's up, my speech slows down. It slows like this, and it's kind of yeah. slurry and garbly, and, yep. and you know, can't be smart enough to figure out how do you multitask a meal to get everything done. And so my meals were one pot meals. You make chili, that's it, you know, and maybe some open up a fresh bag of carrots. Here, honey, have a bowl of chili and some, you yeah. know, whatever. So just sim very simple cooking. Uh, but I'm able to cook a meal now. Here, you know, because I haven't actually seen you today. Like, this is the first time yeah. I'm seeing you today. Cause I'm, and I apologize for running late today. And I thank you so much because it's late today and you're still willing to do this. So thank you so much. So, you know, we've done three prolos. You're obviously doing some stuff for your curve. So maybe mm -hmm. you could tell us what things are better, what things aren't better. Okay. Well... The brain fog is so much better. Awesome. Wonderful. I was to the point where I couldn't balance a checkbook. I couldn't read instructions on how to do something and do it. Yeah. Um, driving in traffic, I was very limited. We actually had to move across town about an hour away because I couldn't drive over to visit my daughter. And at that point, she was having to help me grocery shop, vacuum, you know, do any little thing where you have to go to the store because I was so dizzy I couldn't manage in a store. You know, I had to hold on to the card or my walking stick and, you know, only look at things like either on the left or the right because I couldn't look back and forth. And yeah. uh, it was just uh, really, really incapacitating. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when it got real bad, my personality went really flat. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of my autonomic nervous system things were uh, not working very well. Like what? What symptoms would you uh, have? I was severely constipated for like the last three years. Okay. And uh, now that my uh, right vagus nerve is getting so much better. Yeah, that's, that's what I have here is just yeah. your test results. Like obviously yeah. I, on the first visit we retest you in. Like one of your vagus nerves now is doubled in size, and then you know your yeah. jugular veins are still compressed, but they're but they're better. And then, 
Let's see. I'm, not, I'm actually able to sleep now. I could not fall asleep before. So okay. I was up half the night, and when I did lay down, there was not a position I could lay in that didn't block the uh, jugulars or uh, block a, a nerve. So I was having the shooting pains across the face and shooting pains and uh, in like a vibrating electrical feeling up inside and just all kind of stuff. It made it very hard to get any rest. Uh, but so that's now, a lot better. Oh my goodness, it's like night and day. Okay. I can sleep like, almost like a normal person now. Wonderful. So I still have to wake up and reposition a lot and move just to kind of get it just at the right angle. So, yeah. You know, so. It, well, you talked about, you know, being full of SHIT. I know I'm not supposed to say that word, but you know, when you're <laughs> constipated, you're full. Of, but so how's your bowels? They are so much better. Do you go every day now or no? Yes. Okay, good. Every day. Great. And, uh, That's going to make you feel better yeah. too because you're going to get, you know, detoxify yeah. and everything better. Yeah. And the, you know how you talk about the brain toilet? Yeah, yeah. I can attest to that <laughs> because your brain was like, you'd be like, I don't understand that. I can't read this contract. I can't figure out this checkbook. I can't figure out you know, how the, what button to push on the computer screen, you know? Yeah. And I was always getting a family member to come and help me figure out basic things, and uh, I'm doing so much better. Awesome. I feel human again. Oh, great, Thank you. great, so. great. Uh, have you done any teaching since we've been? No, okay. no, but, it, but the way you're articulating, yes. I would think like you would have a much easier time doing it just, just by the way you explain uh, things. I mean, it was, I'm it going to be told. able to teach next okay. year. Okay. So, Great. yeah, I called my old boss and I said, reserve me a class next year. I'm coming back. So Even from the get-go, you probably, once we figured out what was wrong, you probably, like, had hope restored, I bet. You know, even from the first visit. You know, just knowing that there actually was structural yeah. things that were wrong. And, like, yeah. your jugular veins were compressed, so that's why you had the intracranial hypertension. Like you actually yeah. still have some intracranial hypertension based on the test we did, but it's definitely getting yeah. better. But it, it's more coming and going, and now I know what body position to get in. I okay. have to lay on my right side, tuck my jaw, look slightly to the left, yeah. you know, and then I can get it to lower yep. again. Yep. Uh, and it will clear up in about 15 minutes. It'll drain enough, and then I'll be like, Oh, I can think straight again, and then I can get up and continue. So I do have to take breaks during the day. Is there any symptom, just so I know, because you know I haven't seen you yet today, so I'm just seeing you now. Is there any symptom that you first came that isn't getting better, just so I know? Or do you feel like mm -hmm. the 20 symptoms you had, 20 symptoms are getting better? I would say... All the ones from the neck are getting better. Okay. I still have, uh, I still have one mid back that's like okay. shooting pains okay. around, but all the instability okay. up here okay. is really getting a lot better. Okay. So, so maybe at some point we might evaluate you for that. You know, maybe. Yeah. But you ready to get treated? I am. Okay. I am ready for all the pokes. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing your story. Appreciate it, Snow. Well, thank you. And thank you for making such a life difference for me. And, and Appreciate that. Uh, on a side note, I'm so glad I found you, not just for me, yeah. but I have Miller's Danlos and my daughter has it. And so now she knows where to go and what to do. Thank you guys so much for watching and I hope this helped explain kind of a complicated condition, semicircular canal dehiscence.